Welcome to the book summary of Your Erroneous Zones by Wayne Dyer. Published in 1976 and weighing 256 pages and having sold over 35 million copies. If you're plagued by guilt or worry and find yourself unwillingly falling into the same old self-destructive patterns, then you have Erroneous Zones, whole facets of your approach to life that act as barriers to your success and happiness. Dyer shows you how you can take charge of yourself and manage how much you will let difficult times and people affect you. Dyer gives you the tools you need to break free from the negative thinking and enjoy life to the fullest. The book is available on Amazon with the link in the description to buy. So without further ado, I bring you the book summary of Your Erroneous Zones. The whole theory of the universe is directed unearily to one single individual, namely you. Chapter 1, Taking Charge of Yourself. The essence of greatness is the ability to choose personal fulfillment in circumstances where others choose madness. A true barometer of intelligence is an effective, happy life lived each day in each present moment of every day. Your thoughts are your own, uniquely yours to keep, change, share, or contemplate. No one else can get inside your head and have your own thoughts as you experience them. You do indeed control your thoughts, and your brain is your own to use as you so determine. You cannot have a feeling, emotion, without first having experienced a thought. Take away your brain and your ability to feel is wiped out. A feeling is a physical reaction to a thought. Your conclusion is also inescapable. If you can control your thoughts and your feelings come from your thoughts, then you are capable of controlling your own feelings. And you can control your feelings by working on the thoughts that preceded them. Simply put, you believe that things or people make you unhappy, but this is not accurate. You make yourself unhappy because of the thoughts that you have about the people or the things in your life. Becoming a free and healthy person involves learning to think differently. Once you can change your thoughts, your new feelings will begin to emerge, and you will have taken the first steps on the road to your personal freedom. Happiness is a natural condition of being a person. The evidence is plainly visible when you look at young children. What is tough is unlearning all the shoulds and oughts that you've digested in the past. Taking charge of yourself begins with awareness. You get unhappy, angry, hurt, and frustrated automatically because you've learned to think that way a long time ago. A thought becomes a belief when you've worked on it repeatedly, not when you simply try it once and use your initial inability as the rationale for giving up. Just as you are free to choose happiness over unhappiness, so in the majority of events of everyday life, you are free to choose self-fulfilling behavior over self-defeating behavior. Now is all there is, and the future is just another present moment to live when it arrives. One thing is certain, you cannot live it until it does appear. Avoiding the present moment is also a disease in our culture, and we are continually being conditioned to sacrifice the present for the future. Seize the present moment as the only one you have, and remember, wishing, hoping, and regretting are the most common and dangerous tactics for evading the present. Frequently, avoidance of the present leads to the idolization of the future. The right time is any time that once is still so lucky as to have live. As you look back on your life, much the way toll stories Ivan Illich did, you'll find that seldom experienced regret for anything that you've done. It is what you haven't done that will torment you. The message, therefore, is clear. Do it. The only evidence of life is growth. People are always blaming their circumstances for what they are. I don't believe in circumstances. The people who get on in this world are the people who get up and look for the circumstances they want, and if they can't find them, make them. George Bernard Shaw. Changing the way you think, or feel, or live is possible, but never easy. In order to master this kind of fulfillment, you'll need to repeat endlessly that your mind really is your own, and that you are capable of controlling your own feelings. Chapter 2. First Love. Self-worth cannot be verified by others. You are worthy because you say it is so. If you depend on others for your value, it is other worth. Love is a word that has as many definitions as there are people to define it. Try this one on for size. The ability and willingness to allow those that you care for to be what they choose for themselves, without any instances that they satisfy you. Aptitude is the amount of time required by the learner to attain mastery of a learning task. Implicit in this formulation is the assumption that, given enough time, all students can conceivably attain mastery of a learning task. John Carroll. Self-love means accepting yourself as a worthy person because you choose to do so. 
Acceptance also means an absence of complaint. Independent thinking is not only unconventional, it is the enemy of the very institutions that constitute the bulkwood of our society. Chapter 3. You don't need their approval. Your children are not your children. They are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. They come through you, but not from you. And though they are with you, yet they belong not to you. A careful look at Jesus Christ will reveal an extremely self-actualized person, an individual who preaches self-reliance and was not afraid to incur disapproval. They recognize that people are infected with the need for acceptance. Habit is habit, and not to be flung at the window by any man, but coax down the stairs a step at a time. Mark Twain. Happiness is an absence of approval seeking. Chapter 4, Breaking Free from the Past. You are what you choose today, not what you've chosen before. Once you label me, you negate me. All self-labels come out of the individual's history, but the past, as Carl Sandburg said in Paris, is a bucket of ashes. All self-defeating I am's are the result of the use of these four neurotic sentences. That's me. I've always been that way. I can't help it. And that's my nature. Chapter 5, The Useless Emotions, Guilt and Worry. Throughout life, the two most futile emotions are guilt for what has been done and worry about what might be done. There they are, the great wasters, worry and guilt, guilt and worry. It isn't the experience of today that drives men mad. It is the remorse for something that happened yesterday and the dread of what tomorrow may disclose. Guilt is not a natural behavior. It is a learned emotional response that can be only used if the victim teeth is vulnerable. The best antidote to worry is action. Chapter 6, Exploring the Unknown Only the insecure strive for security. Only the insecure strive for security. Early training in our society tends to encourage caution at the expense of curiosity, safety at the expense of adventure. Failure is simply someone else's opinion of how a certain act should be completed. I have revised some folk wisdom lately. One of my edited proverbs is, Nothing fails like success because you do not learn anything from it. The only thing we ever learn from is failure. Success only confirms our superstitions. Think of it. Without failure, we can learn nothing. And yet, we have learned to treasure success as the only accepted standard. We tend to shun all experience which might bring about failure. Apprehension of failure is a big part of fear of the unknown. Anything which doesn't smack of guaranteed success is to be avoided. And fear in failure means fear in both the unknown and the disapproval that accompanies not doing your best. The unknown is where growth resides. The unknown is where growth resides, both for civilization and for the individual. Two roads diverged into a wood, and I took the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference, Robert Frost. Chapter 7, Breaking the Barrier of Convention. Thus, you have one-fourth of the people taking responsibility for their own feelings and three-fourths bestowing blame on external sources. Instead of recognizing that she had chosen to overeat in the past and she would have to learn to make new choices if she wanted to lose weight. Recognize that her unhappiness and her complaints were the result of her own choices, not the actions of others. You can never find self-fulfillment if you persist in permitting yourself to be controlled by the external forces or persist in thinking that you were controlled by external forces. Blame is a neat little device that you can use whenever you don't want to take responsibility for something in your life. It is the refuge of the externally orientated person. The only thing blame does is keep the focus off you when you are looking for external reasons to explain your unhappiness or frustration. But blame itself is an act of folly. Taking credit as well as responsibility for yourself is the first step to eliminating this erroneous zone. Taking credit as well as responsibility for yourself is the first step to eliminating this erroneous zone. People are different and they see things from a different perspective. If one must be right, then a breakdown in communication is the only predictable outcome. The shoulds always produce a feeling of strain, which is all the greater the more a person tried to actualize his shoulds in his behavior. Furthermore, because of the externalizations, the should always contributes to the disturbance in the human relations in one way or another. You recognize that the law is there to serve you, not to make you a servant. You can begin to eliminate the masturbation behavior. 
People ridiculed the Edisons, Henry Fords, Einsteins, and the Wright brothers until they were successful. You will meet with contempt too as you begin to resist meaningless policies. And chapter 8, The Justice Trap. Fairness is an external concept, a way of avoiding the taking charge of your own life. Jealousy is really a demand that someone love you in a certain way, and you saying it isn't fair when they don't. It comes from a lack of self-confidence, simply because it is another other-directed activity. It allows their behavior to be the cause of your emotional discomfort. People who really like themselves don't choose jealousy or allow themselves to be distraught when someone else doesn't play fair. A foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds, Emerson. Live by acting, not by thinking about acting, Carl Castaneda. Live by acting, not by thinking about acting. Eliminate external references of comparison. Have your own goals independent of what Tom, Dick, or Harry do. Set out to be what you want without references to what others have or don't have. And chapter 9, putting the end to procrastination now. The art of keeping up with yesterday, procrastination. Putting it off enables you to delude yourself into believing that you are something other than what you really are. Make a decision to live five minutes at a time. Instead of thinking of tasks in long-range terms, think about now and try to use up a five-minute period of doing what you want, refusing to put off anything that would bring about satisfaction. Sit down and get started on something you've been postponing. Begin a letter or a book. You'll find that much of the putting it off is unnecessary since you'll very likely find the job enjoyable once you give up the procrastination. Simply beginning will help you eliminate the anxiety about the whole project. And chapter 10, declare your independence. In any relationship in which two people become one, the end result is two half people. In a successful marriage, a marriage where both partners feel genuine love, each is willing to let the other person choose for himself rather than to dominate. No one has control over your feelings except you. And chapter 11, farewell to anger. It is impossible for you to be angry and laugh at the same time. Try it. Anger and laughter are mutually exclusive, and you have the power to choose either. Laughter is the sunshine of the soul, and without sunshine, nothing can live or grow. And perhaps the single most outstanding characteristic of healthy people is their unhostile sense of humor. And chapter 12, portrait of a person who has eliminated all erroneous zones. Do as do, critics blame and complain. Every normal function of life holds some delight. And that's a wrap on this fantastic book by Wayne Dyer, Your Erroneous Zones. Look back on our channel for previous video book summaries and subscribe to our channel now for future books. Don't forget to check out our website, bestbookbits.com. To buy the book, click the link in the video description to purchase from Amazon. Thanks for watching and I hope you learned a thing or two about Your Erroneous Zones. Have a great day.